77. I have some friends over here laughing at me. Uh, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Um, we are uh, we are Space Drafts. We are the Tucson version of Astronomy on Tap. Astronomy on Tap is a um, Um, uh, astronomy on Tap is a worldwide network of local astronomy public talks taking place in bars all over the world. So if you're not from Tucson, uh, check out astronomyontap.org. There's probably one nearby wherever you are from. Um, so tonight we have two exciting speakers. We have, uh, first up, we have Joseph Long, who is my compadre in my research group. We, we uh, work on everything together. And in fact, that's me in that picture right there. Uh, and um, after Joseph's talk, we will have a 20-minute intermission, followed by uh, another talk by uh, Basilis, who is a uh, faculty at um, the University of Arizona, um, the Stewart Observatory, on uh, faster than light travel. So, so pretty two pretty exciting talks for you tonight. Let's see. So we have one tradition here at Space Drafts. You may know we are right next to an active train line, so if the, in the very likely event that a train will go by during a talk, what do we like to do here? Anybody? Raise a glass. We raise a glass and we say choo-choo and we take a drink. Um, so that will probably happen, so um, be prepared for that. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. Um, we, are, uh, we have started a new feature. If you follow us on Twitter or on Facebook, we have started Friday Fun Facts, um, where our very own Matthew Murphy, Murphy will tweet and Facebook uh, some astronomy fun facts every Friday. So if you're not following us on Twitter and Facebook, please, please do so. And that's also your best way to find out about events um, that, and uh, our shows um, and in astronomy events around town as well. Um, if you, oh, you can also tonight, um, if you, uh, Borderlands is also offering glitter beer in your, so you can get edible glitter in your beer uh, in support of Pride Month. And a portion of the glitter beer sales gets donated to a local uh, charity organization. So please consider uh, the glitter beer. I already had one, it was great. Um, without further ado, I think that's all I have to say. Um, oh, one more thing. We do have stickers uh, for sale still, um, $2 each. Your support of our merch allows us to buy more merch. Um, so please uh, pick up a sticker for $2. Um, and we are still hoping to get, we will have pint glasses soon. Sorry, they're still not here. I've been saying that every month, but it's, they're still not here yet. Um, and we are also looking at um, hopefully getting some t-shirts soon. So um, the more you pr uh, support us with stickers, the more we're able to bring newer and exciting merch uh, as well. Um, we also have a tip jar up front, and don't forget to tip your bartender as well. Um, and so I think that's all I have to say. So without further ado, I will introduce Joseph Long, um, who will tell us about what to expect when detecting a planet. So please give him a round of applause. Hi, everyone. I'm, uh, I just finished my fifth year as a PhD student at Stewart Observatory. I closed my eyes in March 2020, and then something happened, and, and now here we are. Um, this talk is going to be about the project I've been working on for the last few years uh, to, build an to build an instrument to detect planets around stars other than our sun. So that's me back in 2018 when the world was young, <laughs> and uh, that is the Magellan Clay 6.5 meter research telescope in the Atacama Desert in Chile. That's a zoomed out view. So this is the machine we use. The whole thing together helps us detect planets and disks around other stars. But the part that has been built at University of Arizona, well, more recently, is this optical bench and the uh, electronics rack represented by the featureless gray cube. So. This is the uh, brainchild and baby of Dr. Jared Mayles, my advisor, who happens to be in the audience tonight. And using it, we're able to uh, leverage the full power of the Magellan Telescope to take high contrast, high resolution images of stars and hopefully find planets around them. Of course, when we use it, we mostly keep the dust covers on. And this is what we can make. These are all from our most recent trip to Chile, which we just, feels like we just got back from. 
And I'm going to show you a little bit about how these sorts of photos get made. Because I'm an exoplanet astronomer, I'm contractually obligated to have a plot showing all of the planets that have been found and confirmed outside our solar system. It's all color-coded by how we detected them, but I want to point out the imaging planets. These are the ones that we've actually taken a picture of. And you may notice that they're kind of, they don't, they don't really overlap the other ones all that much. They're mostly further away, so the x-axis is how far away the planet is from its host star. And they're mostly higher mass, so where that plot sort of cuts off and you don't see any more dots above it, that's, that's about as big a planet as you can make. And I wanted to include one other planet, which is the only one where we have actually found life, and that's Earth. And you may notice that it doesn't overlap. We haven't taken a picture of any of these Earth-like planets you may have seen headlines about, because those have all been detected by these other methods. So transit, radio velocity, <laughs> microlensing, and there are actually many other ways, but those are the most popular. So the vast majority have been detected by the transit method, and I'm going to explain what that is. But uh, imaging is, is really pu pulling in a solid fourth place for total number of planets discovered. So why, why is it so much fun to work on? Well, so these three methods are called indirect detection methods. They change aspects of the star we're looking at in ways that we can observe from Earth by, say, blocking part of the light, or uh, bending some of the light around it in the gravitational microlensing case, or by pulling the star around their common center of mass for the radial velocity detections. You can detect very small changes in the color of the star as it's moving towards or away from you. But indirect detection is, is sort of like, well, like, like indirectly detecting a burglar. If you looked out your window and you saw this, you would be pretty sure there's someone there. But you couldn't answer other questions, like, who is that? Is that blood or ketchup? Do they have uh, ill intent, or do they just need to borrow my sink? Direct imaging is more like what you do with your eyes when you look up at the night sky. In fact, you can directly image planets with your naked eye alone. They just happen to be the ones orbiting our sun. So if you've ever looked at uh, one of our, our brighter planets, like Mars or Jupiter, in the um, early hours of dawn. You may have noticed that it gets harder and harder to see planets when the sun is up. This is actually our problem in direct imaging. When we're looking at other solar systems, the sun's up. It's always up. We're staring into their sun, trying to see a very faint planet right next to it. So, it's not actually quite like taking a picture or looking with your bare eyes. It's more like distillation. We take the light, which is always going to be a mix of light from the star and light from the planet, and we use algorithms, fancy hardware, fancy optics, and what we hope to get at the end is just the light, just the signal of the exoplanet or the disk that we're trying to take a picture of. So, something that uh, I don't think Logan covered is that we have a tradition of multiple choice trivia questions embedded in our talks. And it's time for the first one of those. So which detection method has found the largest number of planets around other stars? Just raise your hand, don't shout it out, and I will point at someone. Yes, you. That is correct, and there is a small prize of some kind that Lily will get you during the break. Woo! Can you raise your hand, whoever, whoever wants? Okay, so we are trying to look at something really faint right next to something really bright. We call this high contrast imaging. So you might hear people call it exoplanet direct imaging or high contrast imaging. The terms overlap, they're not totally interchangeable, but this is one of the things that we need to find a planet around another star. The other thing we need is high resolution. So. In the days before HD TV and 4K TV, resolution was something that really opticians and photographers cared about, but it didn't really have anything to do with the number of pixels. It was the ability to distinguish two things in a scene, two very fine lines right next to each other, or in this case, a tree emoji and a cat emoji. So, 
They're in the middle distance. You're looking at them. You can close one eye and be like, yeah, yeah, I got it. That's about how far apart they are. As they move further away, they appear closer together until they get to the point where you can't really tell them apart at all. And at that point, we say we cannot resolve them. So a, when we can resolve two objects, we can measure the separation between them. We can distinguish one from the other. So it turns out there's actually a relationship between the size of your telescope and the smallest feature you can resolve. So over here, we have the first panel is the size of our telescope, if we're looking straight down at it, so just big circle. We have the smallest feature that telescope can see, and we have the scene on the right. And I'm going to play a video, and as we make the telescope bigger, we can resolve more details in the scene. The telescope is smaller, and it all gets blurred together. This is the problem that we have. We are trying to distinguish these two things that are very close together, and we need a large telescope to do so. So, is that enough? Well, in space it is, actually. Uh, if you have a six and a half meter telescope in space and you point it at a star, you are going to get the full resolving power of that six and a half meter telescope. These are the ones we use, the Magellan telescopes at, in the Atacama Desert of Chile. And they're definitely not in space. They are also about a factor of 100 cheaper. But they have this problem that they're looking through Earth's atmosphere. And this is something that, that really doesn't even need explanation for an Arizona audience. <laughs> if you get hot air moving around and you're looking through it, your images get distorted. The ability to measure fine details gets all messed up. And this is most apparent near the ground when the temperatures are really hot, but you could also just be looking through a lot more air and the effect sort of builds up. So if you look straight up or straight that way, you're looking through about as much air as you can and these aberrations, these distortions, will build up and will mess up your image. So that's where this bunch of optics and optomechanical devices comes in. We use this to untwinkle the stars. This is the system from our 2019, uh, very first time we ever used it. And it's starting out, these two panels are, we have a pair of cameras that are pointed at the star. These two panel, panels at lower right. And when the video starts, the system is not correcting for the atmosphere. So you'll see a whole bunch of mess. And then when we turn the system on, you can see right there, there's a little dot that you couldn't see before. It just pops out. This is the purpose of an adaptive optics system. Adaptive optics takes the effects of the atmosphere, measures them thousands of times a second, and then corrects them out before the light even hits the camera. So that is how we solve our high resolution problem. We want to get the full resolution of our six and a half meter ground-based telescope. But how does it solve our high contrast problem? It turns out that if you can solve your high resolution problem, you've got a really good angle of attack on the contrast problem. So here, you can't see much, but it is the focused point of light from our system working really well. And I'm going to play a video here. You see it jittering around a bit. Then we gradually move this dot in front of it, and if this were winter, you would be able to see things. But since the sun only just went down, this is a somewhat disappointing video. I knew I should have done it in the purple color map. But once you've concentrated light into a tiny point, you can block it out with a tiny point without also blocking out your planet. So. How do you use an adaptive optics system? Here I want to go into a little bit of the sort of the logistics of how projects like this work that I feel like doesn't really get a lot of airtime. We we talk a lot about the cool scientific results and we don't talk as much about the process that 
gets the data into the hands of the astronomers. So this is the route our instrument took from our lab in Tucson, the long way around, you can see it went to LA first, to the observatory in Chile. It takes weeks, costs thousands of dollars, and involves a whole ton of people. This is our uh, packing, moving out uh, from earlier this year. That's the main instrument. This is the electronics rack. By the way, none of those were, only about half of those were graduate students. We, we have a lot of engineers yeah, right. and uh, other people involved in other parts of Stewart Observatory that we are able to call upon to help us with things like forklift driving. Um, then we loaded on a, a plane, or rather our contractors loaded on a plane. I found a fun fact while I was preparing this talk, which is a total non sequitur, but I hope you'll indulge me. <laughs> the air cargo carrier we used, Tampa Airlines, it started out as a purpose-built airline to ship flowers from Columbia to Miami. Like, that's the only thing they did. They were like, well, like, they're perishable, you can't put them on a boat. So they were, they were flying flowers back, and back to the US, and eventually they figured they should put something on the planes for the return journey and make more money that way. <laughs> this is where we end up. It's a little rugged. They actually uh, keep us in pretty high style when we're staying there. Um, people who have been to other observatories tell me that it is uh, enviable, but it is, it is still miles from anywhere. You can barely see with this projector two little nubbins on the top of that peak. Those are the Magellan telescopes that I showed you the picture of before. The Las Campanas Observatory site is home to a, a handful of other telescopes as well, and they share common infrastructure, uh, machine shops and engineers and so on. Uh, my sister's in the audience tonight, and she's a wildlife biologist, so I felt like I had to include some of the local fauna. We're not the only ones living up there, but it, it really is a, a pretty unforgiving place. Our uh, mascot, more or less, is the noble Viscacha. This is, it's not a rabbit. And it's not a squirrel, but it sort of looks like a cross between the two. It's related to a chinchilla, and the mountain is positively crawling with them. We consider them a good luck charm. So this is after the whole shebang gets there. This is our air ride truck, fresh from Santiago. These are a couple of our engineers operating their shiny new forklift. This is Jared. He is happy that nothing from the expensive instrument was damaged in shipment. We actually unpack the whole thing, which is not, not, a, not a trivial task. We cable it all together, we turn it on, and before we even go to the rest of the way up the hill to the telescope, we have to make sure everything works. We need to request replacement parts, if any, and uh, look for any signs of damage. Since it was COVID times, we had to do this in two different rooms over <laughs> Zoom. This is Laird Close, uh, optomechanical lead, and we're driving the software, that's uh, Sebastian Habert, uh, from the library upstairs from where they're doing all their work. It was a little bit tedious. The process of installing on the telescope involves a crane, a bunch of people in hard hats, a bunch of student labor. <laughs> so the uh, ring you can sort of see peeking out at the upper left, that's sort of circle, the center of that is where the light that the telescope focuses comes out. And we need to align our instrument to that or else we can't see anything. That process is somewhat tedious, but uh, we got a really good alignment. We also need to connect all of the cables between these two uh, pieces of equipment. And we occasionally do need to take the dust covers off when we're at the telescope because things will break when we're actually trying to use them. 
When it's all working, uh, you need at least six monitors to keep an eye on everything. Uh, probably a few more, not visible because they're behind the camera. And this is what we get for our troubles. This is a protoplanetary disk called HR4796 that is part of one of our collaborators' research programs. And these images were prepared by Jared from data that we just took a few months ago. There's a substellar companion. So over at the left, you can see the, the substellar companion at top left. And you can also see where we've canceled out all the starlight in the middle. So that's the process I was talking about, where we're distilling the planet light and subtracting off the starlight selectively. We can take a rainbow of images in different wavelengths, different uh, filters, essentially. And then at the right, we have an image of two tiny points of light corresponding to planets that are in the middle of formation, that are actively accreting material. And that is more or less what to expect when you're detecting a planet. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Make sure to follow our blog. It's only about 50% science, but it's all entertaining. And yeah, happy to answer any questions. Where we're pointing? So before we, when, when our trip to Chile is but a twinkle in an astronomer's eye, we have a list of targets. So we have to make sure that our targets that we want to look at will be available, as in they'll actually go above the horizon and we can point the telescope at them at the times when we are scheduled to be on the telescope. So there's a bunch of constraints that sort of work together to down select from all the stars in the sky to the ones that we're going to look at tonight. How we choose what goes on our original list before we cut it down, we look for things that show promising signs that they might host an exoplanet that has not yet been discovered, for example. Or we follow up on discoveries that other people have made and we use our instrument's unique capabilities to do our our own observations of them. Thanks. Ah, uh, question. All right. Why? Why do you like direct imaging? As why? Why do you personally enjoy direct imaging as opposed to some other way of setting up planets? Direct imaging. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So what? What? What's my reason for doing direct imaging when it, we're number four? You <laughs> it's know. Really hard. <laughs> Well, I mean, some, some things are worth doing because they are hard. And the sort of conceptual clarity of pointing at a picture and saying, yep, that is the planet, is something you don't actually really get with indirect detection methods. You can't say, oh, that's the planet with, that we've isolated, and now we're going to do things like measure the color of it. That's something that you need direct imaging to do. The color of it can tell you things like, well, are there clouds? Are there seasonal variations? Can you disperse it into a spectrum and find signatures of life? These are all reasons to do direct imaging and make yourself an image of the planet around the other star. All right? Yeah? What's next? What's next? Uh, we've got an upgrade planned. So the architecture of the instrument is uh, uses a bunch of things called deformable mirrors to counteract atmospheric aberrations. We're getting a much fancier one, and we're putting that in there. We're going to upgrade some of our cameras, and we're hoping to go back in the winter. Well, North American, uh, Northern Hemisphere winter, Southern Hemisphere summer. All right. If that's all. Oh, one more. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, 
are our upgrades more incremental, or is this going to you know blow the whole thing wide open? Is that sort of the, the gist of it? Well, um, it, this this is very hard to do, and it's in some ways a game of inches. We are expecting to have better performance, but what we're really shooting for is the eventual creation of an extreme adaptive optics instrument. This subset of adaptive optics instruments is called extreme because it's able to do such high contrast, high resolution, high speed, for an upcoming giant telescope, like the Giant Magellan Telescope that Arizona's a partner in. So that is, that's what we're shooting for. That's the sort of long-term goal. And in the meantime, we're going to make the best instrument that we can for the regular Magellan Telescope. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I, my, I would like to second uh, about following our blog. It is very hilarious and witty because we are all very hilarious and witty people. Uh, <laughs> um, also, I, I always maintain that the more viscatches in your presentation, the better the presentation. Um, <laughs> all right. So it is now uh, five till eight, I believe. Uh, it's basically eight. Um, so we will take a 20-minute uh, intermission. So we will come back here at 8.20, um, and we will hear from um, our next speaker. Uh, during that time, please feel free to go grab a beer, um, uh, grab a sticker. Uh, you, uh, Joseph and myself are also around to ask any, uh, answer any other questions that you have about this kind of research, because it's awesome and we love it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll see you back here in 20 minutes at 8.20.
I'll turn this up. Don't do that when you're like right up against it. All right, it is 8.20, so we are back for our second speaker of the night. Uh, up next we have Professor Vasilis Pascalidis and his, uh, his peanut gallery over here. Um, <laughs> woo! Lots of support. Um, and uh, you should have gotten, there's some audience participation items that I hope you all have gotten your hands on so you can participate. Um, so without further ado, please welcome our second speaker, Vasilis Pascalidis. Thanks a lot, Logan. How's everybody doing tonight? Woo! Yeah! Woo! Cheers. Woo! All right, so my name is Vasilis Pascalides. I'm a professor at the University of Arizona in the Department of Astronomy and Physics. My research, my primary research, is in the field of gravitation. So I study space-time or Einstein's theory of general relativity. So I thought it would be really fun to basically ponder the question that is on this slide. Is travel faster than the speed of light possible. So I'll try to tell you what science has to say about it. And in the meantime, I'll try to make it a little bit fun. So I'll try to uh, also engage you all. Uh, and feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any questions. I want this to be an interactive experience. I don't want it to be a monologue. I want it to be a dialogue. I'll try to provoke you as well. <laughs> and. Um, Another disclaimer is that there's a fellow astrophysicist, Brian Gensler, who has actually given a talk on a similar topic, so I've borrowed a lot of his ideas. Not all of them, some of them. Uh, and then I just mixed it up with my own ideas about how I should present this topic. For the graduate students in the, in the audience, this is not how you should give a talk. So this is an example of how you should not give a talk. Always acknowledge the people, always give proper credit to everybody, so I didn't have the time to do that. We're all busy, you know, we're in the middle of the pandemic, kind of. So, um, so with that, let's just try to answer the question. Is faster than light travel possible? First of all, I'm going to ask you, why would you like to travel super fast? So I just want to hear the audience. Raise your hand and give me a reason. Why would you like to travel super fast? Yes. Okay, everything where? Everything in the universe. Don't you want to see okay, that? fantastic. That's a great answer. Yes. Bypass that bad traffic. <laughs> That's a good one. Bypass the bad traffic. Other responses? Get there sooner. Say it again? Get there sooner. Get there sooner. That's what we've been trying to do all our lives. Like, we try to improve the way we transport things, you know, faster and faster so that we can get anywhere we want to get sooner. Visit other places. Visit other planets, fantastic. All right, so say it again. Strava. For Strava. Hmm, <laughs> you have a very distorted way of thinking. <laughs> Strava, hmm. Okay, you wanna run faster, I guess. <laughs> okay, so I'll try to answer this in the way that I think is uh, important. And I'll play this movie, if you can. Please. So, in my opinion, humans are explorers. We strive to learn new things. Since Homo erectus, we've been expanding through our own planet. We try to see where we can go, how far we can go, to explore things that we've never seen before. Not just other planets. Civilizations to boldly go where no one has gone before. Woo! To boldly go where none has gone before. So that's really the bottom line. And for those who are being careful and paying attention, 
to the credits, there's going to be a trivia question. <laughs> All right. So, so really, it's about interstellar travel, or in my opinion, it's actually not just interstellar travel, but even intergalactic travel. So how would we want to do that? Let's see if it's even possible with what we have nowadays. Thank you. So the best technology that we have at our disposal, it's rocket science. So the principle <laughs> is very, very simple. You just have this huge fuel tank, you burn the fuel, you direct the outcome of the burn in a particular position, in a particular direction, and that pushes the shuttle in the other direction. Just good old fashioned action and reaction, nothing very complicated, just want to make sure that you just don't blow up this thing. So what's the fastest thing, the fastest like mission we've ever built as humans? Turns out, actually it happened very recent, about maybe a couple of years ago, the spacecraft that is known as Parker Solar Probe managed to achieve 364,660 miles per hour. Like just for comparison, when you drive your car, you know, you just go like 60 miles an hour, as you all know. Of course, if you want to get a ticket, you can go 100 miles per hour, you know, it's up to you. This is about three to like 5,000 times faster than what you can do in your car. Okay? So this is really a phenomenal speed by human standards. Now, the nearest sun to, sorry, the nearest star to, to our sun, not to Earth, because the nearest star to Earth is the sun. Okay? So the nearest star to the sun is Proxima Centauri, and it lies at a distance of about 25 trillion miles from us. Okay? So now, you can probably know billions and millions, you know, in terms of dollars and all these things. Trillions, if you really want to visualize the number of trillion, if you cannot, just think about the entire gross domestic product of the United States. That's about 20 to 25 trillion dollars. Okay. So this is a big number. So if you're going at this speed, if you want to go to Proxima Centauri, that's going to take about 70,000 years. That's several tens of thousands of or thousands of lifetimes, human lifetimes. It's not really practical if we wanted to go to the nearest star. And by the way, there is a planet, at least one planet in the nearest star. So that's maybe we have a reason to go there. So can we get a little bit more creative and maybe not use fuel? Because one of the reasons why rockets are so slow is because they're actually pretty massive. So if you want to be able to go fast, you have to just make things lighter. What if we can just get rid entirely of the fuels? And so there's this idea that are called solar sails. Actually, they use no fuel. Just like the wind pushes a sailboat in the ocean and it travels, the same principle can be applied by using the solar wind. Like we know that our stars, the stars in general, have winds of very, very highly moving, um, uh, very fast moving particles. And these particles then can then impart on um, these solar sails and they can just push ships. Of course, science fiction, once again, just like Star Trek, that can actually traverse enormous distances in an instant of a time, has beat scientists and uh, engineers to the finish line. Here's Count Dooku's solar sailor. So we are not the first to think about this. And the question, however, is does this work? And it's actually not science fiction anymore. So solar sails do exist. There's this uh, light sail too by the Planetary Society. Here's basically a room where people just build these things. This is a few, let's say like 20, 30 yards across this light sail. And this black little thing here in the middle, that's kind of like the probe or the spacecraft you would consider essentially. So this is more like a miniature or a small scale version of what an actual spaceship, sorry, spaceship powered by sails would look like. So here's the same thing in space. It has been deployed. Uh, here's the United States. Here's Mexico. This is Baja California. So you can actually see that this thing can fly. In fact, people put it in the orbit. They actually see whether it works. The proof of principle is there. But of course, as a figure of merit, you would like to know how fast this thing can go. When you drive your car, you want to know how fast it can go from zero to 60. Typically, cars will do that in three seconds. This thing does it in four days. So it's not really fast. It's not exactly there yet. 
but we can still ask. This is like the small scale version of that. What if we actually had the full scale? So you can do the calculation, you can do the mathematics behind it, and it turns out that it would get to Proxima Centauri in only 75 years. Now, of course, this would rely on a spaceship that has sails that are about hundreds of miles large, not just the small thing that we have here. And of course, there are practical questions. How do you get into orbit? Because it's not gonna launch itself from down here. How do you deploy this hundred of miles long sails? But it's a viable option. Like within a human lifetime, we can just go to the nearest star. Like, it's really impressive. Now, let's assume that somehow we are able to build a machine that can travel really, really fast. Maybe not necessarily at the speed of light, but it can travel at a fraction of the speed of light. Let's say a tenth or a fifth of the speed of light. If you do that, you have to solve another problem. And that's the problem that in special relativity we call time dilation. So let's hear it from the experts. Can you play the movie, please? This is a movie. Uh, a clip from the movie Interstellar, so... Uh, it's not loud at all. I... It's as loud as it's getting. Sorry. start in the middle. It's weird. Well, no, it's supposed to start in the middle. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. Okay, try again. Go. Okay. Well, every hour we spend on that planet. Seven years back on Earth. Every hour we spend on that planet, it's seven years back on Earth. Oh, jeez. Now, of course, this is uh, for a planet that's orbiting Gargantua, a huge talking. black hole. Right, somebody might think that the dilation that is involved there, time dilation, is due to the fact that you're near a black hole. In fact, that's not entirely true. Most of the time dilation actually comes from the planet moving extremely, extremely fast, very close to the speed of light. So one hour on that planet is seven years on Earth. So imagine that you actually get in a spaceship. So the guy said at the end, that's relativity, folks. So you get in a spaceship, you travel really far away, and one hour you spent away from Earth is seven years on Earth. If you come back, even if you travel for a few hours, everybody that you came back, uh, that you knew before, is gonna be dead. Obviously, that's not something you wanna do, okay? Or you don't even want them to be like 10 years older than you. It's like, so, so time dilation is a problem. And you might say, well, is time dilation a real thing? And the answer is yes. Physicists have confirmed time dilation over and over again since it has been predicted by Einstein in 1905. And it has been uh, it has been confirmed with particle physics experiments. It has been confirmed with airplanes flying across each other and looking at the clocks. And the most practical application of time dilation is the global positioning system, the GPS. If you don't account for the effects of time dilation, the GPS would not work, especially for Everybody who's uh, an outdoor person and they have these smart watches on the on the wrist, the location on Earth that you get from the GPS system would be completely off if we did not account for relativistic effects. Okay, so this is really the perhaps one of the most important applications of relativity in our modern life. So time dilation is real. So we would have to solve these things, but before we talk about solving that, here's the trivia question. What is the name of the actor portraying uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard in the 90s show, the Star Trek, The Next Generation? So is it William Shatner? Is it Patrick Stewart? Is it Scott Batchelor? Or is it Chris Pine? Just shout out. <laughs> I guess a lot of people are gonna get stickers tonight. <laughs> Can you call in somebody? Uh, call in somebody? I don't know. <laughs> Everybody knows the answer. <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> All right, so it is Patrick Stewart, indeed. Um, okay. So let's start to think about a few more exotic options. 
Teleportation. Okay, so, again, science fiction has beat us scientists and engineers. Can you play this one, please? So, this is a, a clip for from uh, the 2009 Star Trek movie. Live long and prosper. It's very simple. Just get into the room, flash your lights, and all of a sudden you get beamed up into a spaceship that travels faster than the speed of light. I love the sound effects in space. You know, sound does not exist in space. So. Okay, and you're on the ship. It works almost. You know, it's not exactly there. You know, sometimes you get beamed up, or sometimes you actually get beamed up to a death trap. So, you know, at least the principle is there. You know, science fiction has figured it out a long time ago. This is not to transition to the next slide. Oh, thank you. Sorry. All right, so um, the good news is that teleportation is real. We have actually managed to teleport things. Well, not things. We have actually been able to teleport photons. So this is a paper that was um, submitted to Nature, actually published in Nature, by Chinese scientists in 2017, who managed to teleport a photon a photon is a packet of light, that's what you can think of it, from a ground station in the Nagari Tibet Observatory to a satellite, the Mishis satellite, about a mile away from Earth. So they did not, of course, the photon itself, the object they teleported, did not move. What they did, they actually transported the information. So they actually measured what is the information of the photon down here, they send it up there, and they created an identical copy of that photon. So that's what modern, what teleportation would be like, and that's called quantum teleportation. So it's interesting, it exists. Obviously, you want an exact copy, especially if you're applying it to a human, you don't want to have, you know, be teleported and missing a limb or anything, you know, so you need an exact copy. Um, but is it practical? Even, you know, like, obviously this is like very primitive right now, it's, it's at early stages, is it practical? So let's just try to think a little bit about it. So it has been estimated that each human cell genetic code is about 1.5 gigabytes of data. And a human body has about 40 trillion cells. So again, trillions, think about the total GDP of the United States. So the total genetic information in a human being is about 60 trillion gigabytes. At the fastest data transfer rates that we have available in our society, which are wireless, not with wires, it would take about 200 million years to um, teleport a human from here to anywhere we want to teleport that human. Now, this is not, of course, is a, is a lower estimate, because really there's a lot more information in the human. There's our experiences, you know, the memories. There's a lot of information that makes us us, right? So. This is really not a number that tells us what the true time would be. For If you do the calculation with some estimates that I've found about what's the total information in a human being, it actually is larger than the age of the universe. So you might as well swim through space to go to uh, Alpha Centauri. Okay, so then the next question that comes to mind is, what is the fastest speed that humans, with anything, have ever been able to achieve? So what physicists like to do when they want to uncover the secrets of the micro world, they try to smash things together. We take atoms, we just accelerate them, we smash them, see what comes out of the collision. We take protons, we smash them, we see what comes out of the collision. That's how we understand what the constituents of what we are made of are. So the biggest experiment that has ever been done, the biggest accelerator, is called the Large Hadron Collider. This is at CERN. It's this ring here that you see uh, it's this like pretty much a size of a city uh, accelerating machine that takes protons in it accelerates them and smashes them together so the fastest speed that has been recorded so far is 186,281 and 998 miles per hour so this is like an insane speed sorry miles per second not per hour um, so this is like extremely close, but not exactly the speed of light. It's actually a little less than the speed of light. 
in fact, anything that we have ever measured in our facilities with our instruments, it can never exceed the speed of light. So how fast is the speed of light? The number very close to the one that I've already told you. It's 186,282 miles per second. That's about 650, sorry, 670 million miles per hour. So just to give you a sense, light goes around the Earth seven and a half times. You can play them with you. Okay? Um, seven and a half times every second. So it goes around the globe seven and a half times every second. So that's extremely fast. That's why we cannot really understand how fast light is. We think that when you switch the light on any lamp, uh, any light bulb, it's instantaneously. And that's because it's so close. So light, you can only understand that it's not traveling at an infinite speed, only if you want to traverse very large distances. So light for our daily purposes is fast, but when it comes to space, it's actually pretty slow. So it takes light from the sun about eight minutes to get to Earth. This means that if the sun suddenly were to disappear from the sky, let's say some magic hand just goes there, just grabs the sun, and just takes it somewhere else, we will not know until eight minutes after. The sun will still be shining in the sky, and we'll find out eight minutes later that the sun has disappeared. It gets worse when, it go, when we go even further. It takes about four years from light from Proxima Centauri to get to us. It gets even worse when we actually think about the other side of a galaxy. It takes tens of thousands of years for light to get from the other side of our galaxy to us. Which means that even if we were to travel at the speed of light, we would need tens of thousands of years to explore our own, our own galaxy. So even the speed of light, if you can travel at the speed of light, it's not a very practical way to traverse all these immense distances. And it gets even worse if you want to go extra galactic. So light from the Andromeda galaxy, one of the nearest, at least, large galaxies, takes 2.5 million years to get to Earth. So to put that in perspective, the light that we see now from the Andromeda galaxy was emitted 2.5 million years ago. So we're actually looking at what the Andromeda galaxy looked like in the past not what it looks like right now. Okay. So the speed of light in vacuum is the ultimate bound on how fast anything physical can travel through space in the universe. This is something that we have tested for over 100 years. It has never been violated, never. This is why it's an axiom that we take it for granted because we always try to measure it. We always try to see whether we can break it. If you were around in 2011, it was a big surge in the media. Uh, certain scientists break the speed of light. I love the titles from the media. It's like they break the speed of light. Time. Was Einstein wrong? Everybody wants to prove Einstein wrong. It's amazing. Faster than light neutrino could be saying yes. The New York Times. Was Einstein wrong? Everybody tries to question Einstein. So five months down the road, scientists did not break the speed of light. It was a faulty wire. So. The only thing that travels faster than the speed of light is human error. Okay. So um, it has never been found to be violated, and it will not be found. It's like we have been, physicists have been very, very careful about that. All right, so no physical object can travel through space faster than the speed of light in vacuum. And I specify in vacuum because light in matter actually travels slower. Like light in air or light in water doesn't travel as fast, it's slow. So it's really in vacuum, in free space, that this is the case. And also I specify here through space, the object is moving through space, okay? So that's important. So let's try to get some understanding. Here I'm gonna uh, try to engage you a little bit. Why objects cannot move faster than light? So I don't see a lot of chairs here, but uh, for those of you that have chairs, I would like to ask your one of your friends to stand up and uh, please do that <laughs> participate <laughs> and everybody else who doesn't have a chair right next to them just look at the uh, people who are standing up and what I would like for the people who are just standing who are sitting uh, try to give a gentle push to the chair so that you just move it slightly as you just push it you give it a very gentle push right and you'll see that the chair is gonna move okay now ask your friend to sit back down 
please sit back down and try to give the exact same amount of push to the chair and see if the chair is moving. Okay. So obviously the chair is not moving. Okay. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is the following thing. There's a, a property that matter has that is called inertia. Inertia is the resistance that matter has into changing its own state of motion. So the chair doesn't want to move, you try to push it, it's going to resist to change the fact that it's not moving. If it's moving it's, and you try to stop it, it's going to resist. That's why when you're in a car and you brake, your body moves forward because your body doesn't want to change the state of motion. It was already moving. That's why it moves forward. That's why we need seat belts. So inertia is a property of matter that says, I don't want to change my state of motion. If I'm moving, I want to keep moving. If I'm stopped, I just want to stay stopped. The reason why when you have the person on the chair that the chair doesn't move is because it's more massive. This has nothing to do with gravity, right? You're not pushing something to lift it. You're not fighting gravity. You're just pushing horizontally. So you're just trying to change the state of motion. The lesson here is that the more massive something is, the harder it is to change its state of motion. The harder, it, the more energy you need to put into accelerating it, into moving it fast. That's why when you try to roll your bike, it's easy to roll your bike. But if you try to move a car, it's very hard. There's no gravity, right? It's heavier, it's more massive. Well, you say heavy, but it's heavy has to do with gravity. It's really the mass that matters. So um, the reason why things cannot move faster than light is connected to this idea. The true reason has to do with the fundamental symmetries of nature, what geometry actually describes nature. Since I cannot teach relativity and I cannot teach uh, differential geometry in you know, like two print seconds, uh, I'm going to use the analogy of the massive object that I mentioned right now, which is a consequence of the fundamental symmetries of nature. So Einstein's theory of special relativity predicts that the faster an object moves, the more massive it becomes. And like we just found out, the more massive something is, the more energy it takes to actually just moving it. And it turns out that if you have a massive object that moves at the speed of light, it would have an infinite mass. Infinite mass means that you need to put an infinite amount of energy. So since there's nothing infinite in nature, you can actually never accelerate anything at the speed of light. Okay, so this is really a consequence of the fundamental symmetries of nature. Not the reason why, but it's a consequence, but that's the practical reason why we cannot achieve faster than light, or even the speed of light. Of course, the next question becomes, have we ever observed anything that travels faster than the speed of light? And this is the uh, demonstration that I will that I distributed the balloons around. So this is the demonstration that I'm going to ask you to do with me. So you probably heard that the universe is expanding. If you have read anywhere in the media, it's like we know that the universe is expanding. So this is a map. The horizontal direction shows the time direction. That as the time increases, this outer shape of this uh, universe, let's say, as you can see, it's increasing in size. The, the diameter of these circles increase in size, they indicate the size of the universe. So essentially the universe is getting bigger and bigger with time. So now what I would like you to do, oh, I'll drop my balloon. Oh, you got it. What I would like you to do is take your balloons, everybody. Uh, first thing I learned when I tried to do that at home, try to inflate them. It just becomes easier a little bit to write on them if you do that. And let it deflate. And then take the Sharpies. Take the Sharpies that I've given you. And what I want you to do is draw three dots. I want you to draw three dots on the balloon. I have one, two, three. And try to make them separated. Use the width of the Sharpie to just separate the three dots by one Sharpie. Uh, Sharpie win. If the Sharpie doesn't write, write on the piece of paper that I've given you and then write on the balloon. But make sure that you separate equidistantly the, the three dots.
So you have three dots and they're separated by about a Sharpie's width, each one. The first one is separated by the second one by a Sharpie width. The second one is separated by the third one by a Sharpie's width. So let's try now to blow it up. And uh, blow it up such that you are about two Sharpies uh, <laughs> apart. Okay? So now, the first dot is about two Sharpies away from the second dot, and the second dot is two Sharpies away from the third dot. Okay. So this means that the first dot is four Sharpies away from the first dot. Okay. So the initial distance was one Sharpie between the first and the second dot. Now it's two Sharpies. The initial distance between the first and the third dot was two Sharpies. Now it's four Sharpies. So it increased further, okay? So in the same amount of time that it took for the two dots, for the three dots to just move away, the dots that are further apart, they move even further away. If something moves further away in the same amount of time, that means that it moves faster, okay? So this is the demonstration of an expanding universe. The dots on the balloon designate the galaxies in our universe. The surface of the balloon is our universe. It's, of course, a two-dimensional analogy of what's going on. Our universe is not two-dimensional. But it's the closest thing we can do such that we can see that objects that are further away, they're actually moving faster away from each other. Okay. So this is important because, because this means that the further away something is, the faster it moves away from us. And of course, it's the opposite. The further we are from something, we move faster away from that as well. So there are galaxies in the universe that actually move faster than the speed of light. So we have seen that. So how is that possible? How can something move faster than the speed of light when relativity says you cannot travel faster than the speed of light? So the answer lies in Einstein's theory of general relativity. So in general relativity, gravity is not a force. Gravity is the space-time curvature. So it actually is the manifestation of space-time curvature. So here's an example of what this essentially is all about. The, here's the Earth. This two-dimensional grid, the green, the green one, designates the space-time. The Earth curves the space-time, and the satellite moves around the Earth because it follows the curved space-time around the Earth. There's no force, there's no magical string connecting us to the sun or any satellite to the earth. There's absolutely no force. It's just the geometry of the space around the earth is such that it just tells the satellite to just move around, move around it. That's what general relativity says. General relativity is the theory of space-time and that's what gravity is. So the usual words that are described, and I'm gonna use this later, matter tells space how to bend and then space tells matter how to move. So the Earth is telling the space how to bend, and the bent space is telling the satellite how to move. That's really the essence behind general relativity. And you might say, well, is general relativity correct? Yes, we have tested it for over 100 years. We have tested it by using eclipse, eclipses of the sun and seeing stars that are exactly behind the sun because the light is bent. We have done that experiment. Actually, it was one of the first experiments that confirmed the theory of general relativity in 1918. We have confirmed it with the motion of planets, the trajectories of planets in our solar system. We have confirmed it with the trajectories of stars that are known as pulsars. We recently confirmed it in 2016 with the existence of gravitational waves. That was a prediction of general relativity. Now we can measure that. And most lately, 2019, the first image of a black hole which agrees exactly with the predictions of general relativity. So general relativity is a solid theory, and what it says, it's a theory of space-time. So the reason why galaxies that are expanding in an expanding universe are moving faster than the speed of light, it's not because the galaxies are moving through space faster than the speed of time, but it's because space itself moving is moving faster than the speed of light. So space in general relativity can be bent, can be stretched, can be worked and it can move faster than the speed of light. So a physical object traveling through space cannot move faster than the speed of light, but space itself can do all sorts of things. Okay. 
So the key to traveling faster than light is really manipulating space-time. And here's the final part of the talk, the warp drive. Okay. So again, science fiction, you know, again, they beat us scientists and Infant, engineers to the finish line. Orbit. Set a course for the Calder system. Warp 9. Warp 9. That's nine times the speed of light. So I, I had to look up actually the definition of a warp speed. It's actually just going at the speed of light. So they were able to travel at nine times the speed of light in this moment in Star Trek. So uh, question, who are my our Mexican brothers and sisters in the audience? Yes. All right. All right. All right. Here's one more reason for you to be proud. In 1994, Mexican theoretical physicist Miguel Alcubierre uh, and you're gonna teach me how to pronounce uh, all my Mexican friends and can you teach me how to pronounce the last name because I'm sure it's not I'm not saying it right uh, he wrote a paper uh, the warp drive hyper fast travel within general relativity so he came up with an idea remember earlier I said you can so general relativity says matter tells space how to bend and then space tells matter how to move what Miguel did was the following thing. He said, what if I reverse engineer things? What if, what if I want to have a very specific space? And then I'm going to try to find out what kind of matter I need to do that. Okay. So he reverse engineer a space line. And he came up with a warp drive. The name warp drive, of course, uh, he later admitted, comes out of Star Trek. So he actually said that it was inspired by Star Trek. So here's the basic idea. What he tried to do was the following thing. He said, I don't care about you know, what matter contact I have in my space. I'm just going to try to design a space that has the following property. I'm gonna have, in front of this ship, I wanna have my space contracting, just like we have the expanding universe and it's moving things away from us. I just wanna have my space contracting so I actually wanna bring things closer to me. Okay? And then behind the ship, I'm actually expanding. So, and here I'm going to use the, the analogy that Brian Gessler gave uh, when he actually talked about this. It's kind of like you're basically, the ship is not moving. It just stays there. And it's like you're being on a carpet, and what you're doing is you're just pulling the carpet. Whoops. Uh, you're pulling the carpet, and you're bringing anything that's on the carpet near to you, and then behind you, it's just the carpet expands. Okay? So that's exactly what happens. So it's not really the space that's moving, sorry, the spaceship that's moving through space but it's the space itself that's coming to you. And that's why it's called the warp drive. You're warping space itself. Okay. So this is the idea. Uh, there's some cool animations that people can find online. I just didn't want to drag this too long. So uh, what I want to say is that this may sound like science fiction. Uh, and it turns out that in order for this to work, you need negative mass, which we know doesn't exist. Uh, but there has been some development since then. People have actually figured out how to modify this idea so that we can actually have positive mass. And NASA's Advanced Proportional Physics Laboratory has actually been trying to put the idea to the test with small scale tabletop experiments to see whether this idea can actually work. So at this time it may appear like it's not visible, but I'll finish this talk by using Einstein's, one of Einstein's famous, most famous quotes. Imagination is more important than knowledge. So uh, stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Everybody understood everything <laughs> or nothing. Okay. <laughs> they, had the, they took the photons and they, and they uh, teleported them to the satellite. Was it, were they making copies of the photons? So the photons still existed at the original site? Yeah. At the, at the satellite at the same time? Yeah, let me repeat the question. So uh, the question is in the teleportation experiment, when you teleported the photon, uh, that was teleported up to the space station or the satellite, did you actually have a copy of the photon on Earth and at the satellite? And the answer is yes, you do. So, so basically, if we were to do the same thing, you would actually end up having multiple copies of yourself in the universe, and you have to put up with yourself multiple times in the universe. So. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. yes. 
Um, that's a great question. So, one thing about particles. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, the question was, uh, how did they know it was the same photon? So, one of the things about particles is that they're actually indistinguishable. All they need, all you need to know, is what kind of information they have. So, a photon that has a particular type of information. If there's another photon that has the same information, you cannot distinguish the two. So really what matters is what kind of information the photon has. And so uh, that's, that's the most important thing. So if I have two electrons, for example, uh, I cannot tell which electron is electron one and which one is electron two if they have exactly the same properties. So that's, that's an important thing in quantum physics. We cannot tell particles apart. But usually that's, you know, in some cases you might, um, but this basically usually goes by you know, particles are indistinguishable. Oh, because they measured the properties of the photon, and, and they found essentially they had the same information in both photons. Um, yeah. Yes. So did they apply the same representation, or did they create a uh, Well, it's it's a little bit more involved. <laughs> so the whole process involves something that is known as quantum entanglement. Uh, and it's it's a little bit. I mean, this is a very interesting quantum mechanical thing that Einstein himself called spooky action at a distance. So you basically prepare two particles that uh, they are in some state that is called an entangled state, and you don't know what they actually what the state is. Then you just take these particles, you move them really far away from each other, you measure one particle, and immediately you know what the other particle should look like. So that's kind of like the basic principle behind this experiment. They use this, this idea of quantum entanglement to uh, make it work. Um, and the reason why Einstein called it spooky action at a distance is because you can really move the particles really far away from each other such that you cannot send any signal to them faster, that even faster, you have to send something faster than the speed of light and you're still not gonna be able to you know, communicate any information. But yet, experiments have demonstrated that this is the case. Other questions? What about wormholes? Okay, so what about wormholes? <laughs> that's, that's my PhD student, Eric, so <laughs> who works also on gravity. So, um, so you might have seen, uh, I don't know, movies like the Event Horizon or some other movies where people say, oh, you know, you can actually bend space, you can just consider it as a sheet, you just bend space, you fold it up, then you create what is known as a wormhole and you pass through the wormhole and everything looks fine. It turns out that most wormhole solutions that exist are either unstable, they will immediately pinch off and close, or if they are stable, they require some exotic matter, like negative pressure, uh, which we think exists um, in the universe. Uh, but even in that case, a physical object usually cannot go through a wormhole. Uh, and so that, that is another problem with wormholes. Um, so that's why I didn't get into that topic. It's, but yeah, it's a great question. Other questions? Uh, just like with the sketches, I'm always happy when when talks have more uh, Star Trek references. Uh, okay, so um, that is it for Space Draft 77. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, there are still more stickers available. Uh, don't forget to tip your bartenders, and if you feeling generous, um, tip us as well. Um, and uh, we will see you back here again on July 19th. Uh, we are here on the third Tuesday of every month. You can follow us on Twitter, you can follow us on Facebook, you can sign up for our mailing list to uh, get notified of our um, events. And um, with that, I'll say have a good evening and um, see you in July. Woo! Woo!